There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Another weekend is here. I'm excited. We're we're getting closer to uh, a very sacred day, Tim. Yes. A day when family comes together and celebrates and laughs and loves and brings me birthday presents. Of course, we're talking about my birthday, November 22nd. Oh, uh, not Thanksgiving, Dave? No? What, was, was what? Throw that aside, do you? What? what what's that word? Th- Thanksgiving, th- 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 Thanksgiving, th- 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 where we get together and and we hmm. celebrate indigenous celebrate the birth of of your uh, no. host and savior Dave Schrader. No, yes, we, that's we, what I was just talking about. We celebrate uh, indigenous Americans welcoming immigrants into the country and feeding them for a change. Uh, that deal. Uh, I do, I, you know. I mean, sometimes we do that too. But I just, you know, my hmm. birthday this year falls on November twenty second, which I oh. thought was very rude of Thanksgiving to go horning in on my birthday. But whatever, we'll just make a well, double. Here's what double I'm gonna, batch of fun. That here's day. what I'm going to do for you, buddy. I'm going to get a turkey and I'm going to shove a bunch of candles in its ass and light it and wish you a happy birthday. How's that sound? Thanks. Just like hanging out with you last year. <laughs> kind of. Only this year it's the turkey that gets the candles in the ass. I'm yeah, not well, here to judge. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Hey, uh, got a quick message here <laughs> from a listener. Okay. Um, and she puts in a lot of effort to some serious uh, blowing sunshine at us, Tim. Oh, wow. Okay. Sending a lot of love. And really what it boils down to is she wants me to give a shout out to a birthday girl. Oh, named huh. Sophie Goforth, but I won't. I won't no? even mention Sophie Goforth's well, name. Why not? Let alone say "Happy Birthday, Sophie Goforth." Well, why would Or do you? something like this: well, "Happy Birthday to you." Happy Birthday to you. I won't do that, why? Sophie Goforth. Why wouldn't you? I think I just did. Oh, Sophie okay. Goforth, thank you very much for listening with your mom on the show. And being a part of our world, and I hope that you have as much fun and giggles as we do doing the show. So uh, thank you for, they're telling me just how long they've listened to the show. They love all the different aspects and all the little fun characters and and everything. The the, the letter's entitled Quick Question and goes on for 18 pages. Oh, well, that's quick. But but she uses the punctuation Mm -hmm. and breaks it up so I can read it. So I appreciate it. Oh, well, God bless her. But Sophie, go forth. You have a fantastic birthday and know that you're loved and adored by your mother and tolerated by Tim and I. So thank you, Sophie, go forth. Wow. Happy, happy birthday from your buddies at Darkness Radio and Beyond the Darkness. All right. Let us get started, Tim, if you wouldn't mind, into the world of supernatural news and parashare. Can I make just a quick, quick, quick announcement? More about that Thanksgiving day? Things no, no not, a, not about the fractured giving day, no. Uh-huh. Um, just a quick uh, disclaimer before we start this whole thing. Okay. I do not have a torture chamber in my studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you hear pounding, yelling, uh, people screaming in foreign languages, it has nothing to do with me hurting anybody. Uh, huh. There are roofers on my roof uh, mm-hmm. as we as we record this. and. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just uh, it's just roofers. It, it's is not, it? Is yeah, it? It's not. Or me. are you enjoying your Adam and Eve box a little too much? <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with. I have not started Adam and Eve parties in my basement. There is no red room of pain. Uh, it's it's just it's just roofing uh-huh. roofing going on as we not roofies roofing. Sure. Where shall we begin this week's journey into the supernatural, Tim? Satan. Oh, well, isn't that special? Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Uh, evidently, Dave, you just can't. Every, everyone's got a, a, a touch button these days. Everyone's touched off by something, Dave. Uh, oh, you just can't. Don't be every, touching my button. Well, I, I won't. I, I promise I'll stay far enough away from your button, even though it is your birthday week. <laughs> <Coming up. laughs> yes. Um, it, it turns out, Dave, that you just can't portray anybody in, in, anywhere these days and, and have it be even the slightest bit off uh, because people are going to get offended. That's just the way it is. You just can't do it anymore. This no. time, Warner Brothers yep. is the brunt of a lawsuit uh, by Satanists. They just, and Netflix, it turns out you just can't put old Satan on TV these days and and uh, you have to do it accurately, evidently. Otherwise, well, they, I think the problem was that they did uh, they did it a little too accurately. I think that's what you'll find. Oh, when, when sharing the story, that's what got them. They that's did, what's getting them them in trouble. Too accurate. Well, well yeah. just months after his, a statue of Baphomet uh, grabbed national headlines while briefly appearing outside the Arkansas State Capitol, the winged goat headed creature has stepped back into the spotlight, and it's about time. By gosh, don't you think? Uh, no, not no, really. no, oh, no. Okay, uh, uh, this time uh, taking its starring turn in the courts. <laughs> Just where he belongs, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, Satanic Temple has sued Netflix and Warner Brothers in a New York federal court, alleging that the media giants lifted and misused, misused, I made a new word, uh, <laughs> its distinctive icon. I've been up since the crack of dawn with these roofers. Um, the organization filed its complaint Thursday, saying its copyrighted statue design, known as Baphomet with Children. I love that show, by the way. Al Bundy was on that show, wasn't he? Love and marriage, love and marriage. It was, it's Baphomet, and he's wheeled in the carriage. I love that show. It was yeah. a great show. Uh, yeah. Appeared without its permission in Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, a new streaming series released on Netflix last month. Uh, the Temple claims that by doing so, the company's committed copyright infringement. <laughs> Didn't know Baphomet had his own copyright out there. Uh, violated its trademark and injured the organization's business reputation. That's right. Satanists make money, too. Uh, all told, it is demanding relief on the order of more than $150 million, Dave. That's how much Satan's worth. Wow. Mm-hmm. So wait a minute. So they embrace the character of Baphomet. Yes. They honor the fact that there should be the free will to have this statue by recreating a CGI version of the statue, putting sure. it in there, and they fear that the use of it in Luciferian ways in the new uh, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is actually bad for them. Whereas I contend, Tim, Mm -hmm. as Dave Schrader, defense attorney at law, that this would be more helpful to them because it's good PR. But you say, Dave, how could it be good PR when it's about Satan and the devil and darkness? Well, they've already embraced that angle and aspect of it. How do you then come out and say that this is actually a bad thing for you? Well, how could it be? Yeah, a bad I, I thing see for this. Uh-huh. Ching, ching. That is proof that money is root of all evil, Tim. Because all they're focused on is the money, money, money. That's true. They're, they're wanting their mm-hmm. money up front. I think is yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the quote here is among other thing, TST, uh, their dynamite. I think is what ACDC said. Um, yeah. The uh, Satanic Temple. That's what TST stands for. Uh, designed and commissioned the TST Baphomet with children to be a central part of its efforts to promote First Amendment values of separation of church and state and equal protection. The complaint explains uh, defendants' prominence use or prominent use of this symbol as the central focal point of the school associated with evil cannibalism and murder blurs and tarnishes the TST Baphomet with children <laughs> as a mark of TST. Again, it's dynamite. You know me. Yeah. Uh, When contacted for comment, Netflix referred NPR's request to Warner Brothers. They're the ones who inquired, uh, which in turn declined to offer a statement. The Satanic Temple argument uh, hinges largely on a side-by-side comparison of two images. Both feature a young boy and a girl gazing um, admiringly at the uh, seated deity which has two fingers raised to the sky as it stares straight ahead. You would think it would be the hook'em horns, but it's not. Uh, what's more, the plaintiff notes that unlike previous depictions, the Sabrina version uses an exposed male chest, Dave, instead of exposed large voluptuous female breasts. So mm-hmm, the argument mm-hmm. here is no titties, Dave, on the Sabrina version. 
a uh, characteristic the Satanic Temple claims to be its own original contribution, which should be observed. That's that's the argument here. Uh, okay. temple- but then if they are saying that it is different, then doesn't that make it different enough that the, the Satanic Church is kind of going to waste some money here? Well, no. See, Dave, it's the it's the Muhammad argument almost to a point. You you don't ever you don't ever slander the God if you choose to put it out there. Oh, oh, not yeah. Muhammad. I, although, I thought you although were referring in the Mo- to Muhammad Ali. No, no, no. Although in the Muhammad argument, you don't put Muhammad out there at all. Otherwise, you lose your. That's head. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Temple co-founder and spokesperson Lucian Graves. Uh, presented the two versions together in a tweet earlier this week for purposes of comparison. Uh, one without Tate's and one with Tate's, so you could mm-hmm. uh, you could see the difference. <laughs> what, um, exact, what, what, what accent is that that you're inflecting? It's a ghettoese, Dave. It's ghettoese. Ghettoese. Gotcha. Tate's. Yeah. One with Tate's and without Tate's. Uh, okay. The uh, statue may look familiar, and just not uh, for Sabrina viewers. Back in August, the Satanic Temple made a national splash with its protest of a Ten Commandments monument that had been installed on Arkansas State Capitol grounds earlier in the year. The temple and other groups, including the American Civil Liberties Union, decried the move as violating the separation of church and state. In reaction to the Ten Commandments monument, the temple hauled out its own seven-and-a-half-foot statue to take up residence on the state grounds, and it held a rally to celebrate the short-lived installation. It came down after just a handful of hours. Now the Satanic Temple is girding for a new fight, saying the series has twisted its publicly espoused tenets, which it says calls for compassion and empathy, the struggle for justice, and conforming beliefs to one's best scientific understanding of the world, among other principles. The series, on the other hand, implies the monument stands for evil, the complaint states, and now the temple is demanding redress in a trial by jury. There you go. Doom, doom. It's a little law and order for you there, Ooh, too. Doom, doom. So SVU stands for Satanic Victims Unit now. Is that what yes. it is? Yes. Oh, I see. Yes, mm. it does. All right. Where are we off I to see. next? Well, uh, now we're headed off. Uh, <laughs> we go from we go from Satanic statues to mm-hmm. voodoo dolls. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, oh, a, it's a natural transition here, Dave. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a story that will absolutely curl your hair, almost literally, a hairdresser has been arrested for making voodoo dolls from customers' hair. And, Dave, I, I think I can speak for you here where this man is just absolutely scary. And I don't say that about many people. I don't find very many people scary. But this man, I don't think I would let him come near my chin hair, uh, much less the, the, what's <laughs> remaining on my Pardon head. Me? Oh, yeah. come near your chin hair. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, but what did you think I said? Doesn't matter. Let's just move on. <laughs> All right. A hairdresser from New Orleans was arrested this morning and accused, well, not this morning, this morning, this morning in this story, and accused of his, using his customer's hair to create voodoo dolls and cast curses upon them. According to the New Orleans Police Department, 29-year-old Enoch Azaka uh, collected the hair he cut from his customers at the Old City Barbershop and used it in black magic rituals. Sounds like a nice guy. I mean, you know. New Orleans Police Chief Ronald Serpice uh, says Mr. Azaka used his skills as a voodoo sorcerer to cause pain and illness to his victims in order to extort money and sexual favors. Again, nice guy. Uh, The victims described suffering from acute migraines, back pain, severe rashes, respiratory problems, and even some sudden and eerie hemorrhages that would cause blood to come out of their nose, eyes, and ears. Mr. Azaka allegedly contacted him them himself to explain that he was a powerful sorcerer and the cause of their pain. Two of his female customers claimed that instead of money, the accused asked them for sex in exchange for dispelling the curses that he had cast on them. Enoch Azaka now faces a total of 184 criminal charges, including 94 charges of theft, 32 charges of extortion, and 48 charges of witchcraft. Witchcraft and the practice of magical arts are still illegal in Louisiana under an old French law that predates the state's acquisition by the United States in 1803. God bless the French for that. And uh, the 1731 Act Against Sorcery and Witchcraft provides that anyone who should use, practice, or exercise any witchcraft, enchantment, charm, or sorcery shall be sentenced to a minimum of 10 years of imprisonment. Well, he's got that going for him. <laughs> Law and Order SVU. I can't figure out what. <laughs> so, oh, Sorcery Victims Unit. There you That's go. Right. Uh, do, do. If found guilty on all charges, Mr. Azaka could get a fine of 
$1,125,000. That's a lot in the tip jar, let me tell you that. And face a total of 835 years of imprisonment. I don't think magic will keep him alive that long. Uh, He was freed a few hours after his arrest on $120,000 bail and should be back in court in October uh, for the beginning of his trial. There you go. Doom, doom. All right, where are we going next? Doom, doom. Oof. Uh, We move on, Mm -hmm. and uh, we move along steadily here to the Irish coast, where UFOs have been spotted off the Irish coast. They have a little Irish spring in their step, so to speak. Dave, as the Irish Aviation Authority, that was my bad joke for the day, is investigating reports. I'm going to hold you to that. (laughs) Of uh, bright lights and UFOs off the southwest coast of Ireland. It began... 6.47 6.47 local time on Friday, November 9th, when a British Airways pilot contacted Shannon Air Traffic Control. I almost want you to do the voice to this, I'm telling you. Uh, she wanted to know if there were military exercises in the area because there was something moving so fast. The air traffic controller said there was no such exercises. Uh, the pilot flying from the Canadian city of Montreal to Heathrow said there was a very bright light and the object had come up along the left side of the aircraft before it rapidly veered to the north. She was wondering what it could be, uh, but said that it did not seem to be heading for a collision. Another pilot from a Virgin plane joined in and suggested it might be a meteor or other object reentering the Earth's uh, atmosphere. He said there were multiple objects following the same sort of trajectory and that they were very bright. The pilot said he saw two bright lights over to the right, which climbed away at speed. One pilot said the speed was astronomical. It was like Mach 2, uh, which is twice the speed of sound. Apostolos Christou, an astronomer with the Armagh uh, Observatory and Planetarium, said it was, or what the pilot saw was probably a piece of dust entering the Earth's atmosphere at very high speed. I somehow no. doubt that. Yeah. Yeah. It was most likely what are commonly called shooting stars, he said. It appears the matter was extremely bright, so it must have been quite a large piece of material. That's a large piece of dust, if you ask me. I cannot say from the, the pilot's description, but it could have been the size of a walnut or an apple, he went on to say. The astronomer said November tended to be a very busy month for such activity. It also appears there were bits coming off the object and flying past the aeroplane. Uh, that is also what you would expect if it were a particularly large rock from space hitting the atmosphere. It would tend to fragment. Following reports from a small number of aircraft on Friday, November 9th of unusual air activity, the IAA has filed a report, the Irish Aviation Authority said. Uh, this report will be investigated under the normal confidential occurrence investigation process. A spokesperson for Shannon Airport said it would not be appropriate for the airport to comment while the IAA investigation is ongoing. Well, now we actually have, Did you were you able to pull this audio? Uh, I do have the file, yes, so we can okay. uh, we can go ahead and insert it in here. Right, I want to play this file, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it. American uh, 86, level 370, and it is smooth again. American 86, Shannon, hello, radar contact, and it seems to be smooth ahead of you as well. Uh, Shannon, see the nice wall. Go ahead. Is there any uh, military traffic you've got right now? 34.260. 34. 134.260. Singapore 25 confirmed. Paper. That's all. Okay, sir, there's, uh, there's nothing showing on either primary or secondary. Okay, it was moving so fast, in fact, you can no longer see it, but yes. Thank you. 590. 505, thank you. Uh, along the side, yeah? Yes. Get to uh, come up on our left hand side and then rapidly veer to the north. Uh, view a so bright light and then it's just this here at a very high speed. I'm um, really just wondering. We didn't think it was a likely collision course, we're just wondering what that could have been. Meteor or another object making some kind of re entry. Seems to be multiple objects following the same sort of trajectory. Uh, so very bright from where we were. Okay, that's copied and uh, is there a direction it was going in or anything? That's right, it's copied, thank you. Uh, the Virgin 76 uh, also saw that in our uh, 11 o'clock position, uh, two bright lights. Roger, that's copy, thank you. Glad it wasn't just me? No, uh, yeah, very interesting, that one. 
say again? Okay, thank you. Okay, we're passing that on now, thank you. Speedbird 94, Shannon. 94, Dennis. Okay, just so you know that uh, other aircraft in the air have also reported the same thing, so we're going to have a look and see. Roger, okay, thank you. Now, what's amazing about this is for them to come out and say this was dust, Tim. I mean, you, you very clearly hear one pilot say, this was a big bright light that pulled up alongside them and then veered to the left. Mm -hmm. The other pilot um, says that there are two lights that came down and then leapt upwards. Right. And one comes in, he's like, oh, it's, uh, it's meteorites. Just, you know, I mean, the, the one's trying to explain it away real quickly. Oh, just entering our atmosphere. Well, they, they'll descend. <laughs> meteorites don't come in and then bank back upwards or fly alongside you and then veer to the left. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I love that you can hear the other pilot and he's like, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one that saw that. <laughs> right. And then <laughs> right. They, at right. the end of the clip when they're talking and, and they're like, you know, multiple uh, craft have now seen these lights. Mm -hmm. This I man, this feels like much more than just a, a couple of meteorites, a couple of uh, falling stars that are zipping by. And this is at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. In Ireland. Right. I just, I think, I think something weird's happening. And as I was researching it, you know, there's been over the last few years, two or three major sightings over the skies in Ireland by the federal, uh, or, or by their Irish, uh, aviation administration and planes. So this isn't new. Uh, it, it, I don't know. I, the audio I think speaks for itself. As a matter of fact, uh, if you go right now over to uh, darknessradio.com and click on the media tab, I actually have a whole video up about this. It's only four minutes long where we, again, kind of describe the story and then play that audio so you can hear the audio um, over and over again for yourself. But judge for yourself. I don't – aside from the one pilot just kind of summarily – or, or I, don't, I can't tell if it's a pilot or one of the tower people summarily dismissing it as a, a, a meteorite, the rest – you can hear it in their voice. They know that's not what they're looking at. And, you know, the one even makes a comment about, well, that was uh, unusual. You could tell that they're being very reserved in the way they're handling what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. So, all right, uh, where are we off to next? Well, Dave, I take a deep breath as I read this next story. <laughs> Cause oh, I, are we about to dislocate your tongue? No, 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 no. It, it's... um. You know, we have this friendly little wager going on about zombies versus <laughs> Skynet. <laughs> Not and, so friendly, And sir. I know there's there's no scientific basis to this next story, but I'll read it anyways. No scientific basis, sir. It's written, and it's an article online. Therefore, how much more scientific can you get? Well, it's the Internet, sir, and it's, it's I don't know how newsworthy this is. This, I said good day, sir. This I said good day article is, but well, I'll read it anyways. OK, the headline says scientists fear brain degenerating zombie deer disease could spread to people. I, I scoff in its general direction. I'll explain why at the end of the article across North America, something horrific happening to deer. It says they are coming down with some mysterious illness that over time destroys the nervous system of the abundant animal. As scientists often concerned when it comes to animal disease, they worry this type of infection could find its way towards humans. It sounds like they are speaking in uncertain terms, but it was reported that this thing known as chronic wasting disease, otherwise known as, <laughs> it's not known as this, zombie deer disease, was first observed in the small town of Fort Collins, Colorado in 1967, which was over 50 years ago. Uh, the official narrative is since that discovery, the disease has since infected wild herds of deer in 25 American states and Canada, even going so far as to reach South Korea and Norway. Uh, this month in Michigan, a four-year-old doe tested positive for the fatal nerve system disease, although the no. methods used to test the, for the illness are not known. Uh-huh. <laughs> Dave, it's, uh -huh. it's okay. It's been around for 50 years. It's, yeah. it's pretty common. In, um, is it? 
It is oh. very common. In Mississippi, two other deer have reportedly tested positive for the illness. Then it was reported on October 28th by Missouri news outlet KTTS 94.7 FM on your FM dial. Uh, that a female deer found deceased also tested positive for it, which brings a total number of recorded CWD cases observed in free-ranging deer in the state of Missouri to 76 since 2011. Oh, my God, it's an outbreak about uh, seven years ago. Uh, the quote from NPR is that CWD passes from animal to animal through prions, misfolded proteins, uh, that cause other proteins to misfold around them. Different prion diseases tend to only harm certain species, but can evolve to overcome those limitations. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Don't you scoff It uh, the zombie it outbreak. transfers from wolves to deer and back again, Dave. That's, that's mm-hmm. about how far it goes. And it couldn't leap to humans at any given time. But why are you not, not affected by the fact that there's necessary. zombie deer and wolves out there, Tim? Dave, we've been eating deer since 2011. Nothing's happened. Maybe you have. I have not. I'm but not a deer eater. You, uh, I just want them to live free, and I want them to pull Santa's sleigh and just be, be uh, happy. You'd be surprised what uh, what's mixed with Except for meat. those psycho sons of bitches that live by my house that keep jumping out in front of my car. Yeah. Those bastards have to die, mm-hmm. Tim. Uh, With that in mind, uh, in some herds, it is reported that as many as half of the deer are carriers of prions. Half of them deer, half of them deer, Dave. Oh, my God, we're going to be overrun by zombie deer. You son of a bitch. Prions, however, are not transmitted through direct contact. It is through plants and soil, actually, that sick animals and their cadavers can spread prions, they believe, which could actually have a coating of deformed proteins that last years or even decades. Oh, my God, we're going to be overrun. The site of an infected animal that has passed away could be a deadly site, in other words, according to this. It is currently estimated that a deer infected with this degenerative disease can live for about two years without so much as showing signs of symptoms, which can include thick saliva, a vacant stare in their expression, Drooping heads or exposed ribs. In other words, they could just be high on crack. Just saying. Uh, despite all of this, there have been zero reported human illnesses due to this disease, Dave. Zero. None. <laughs> A whole lot of nothing. And scientists have even conclusively found that infected meat is harmful to people. But obviously, eating infected meat can't be a good idea, regardless of a species barrier between the disease and people. Mm-hmm. A species barrier, Dave. Mm-hmm. There's a species barrier. Does that between- Just telling you. It all happens that way very soon. There's a species barrier. Nevertheless, wildlife authorities are trying to push for hunting regulations in Colorado and Pennsylvania to fight the disease spreading because they don't want other animals to get it. Then a study from January proceeded to raise more concern. It's not like there are a ton of wild monkeys running around America, which is how it would spread. Uh, But researchers led by associate director at Colorado State University's Prion Research Center, Mark Zabel, found that Uh, Monkeys who ate infected deer meat did, in fact, contract the disease or for the first time show that a primate can catch it through meat. So we essentially would have to get it through monkeys, Dave. (laughs) Wild, wild monkeys. Well, you know, the monkeys are on tour again, Mickey and Mike. So you just might want to think about that before going to the concert, (laughs) that at any time the monkeys could give you this rare zombie disease. So if they eat a venison steak and then somehow made out with us, that's how we would get the disease. Is that what you're saying? Right. There's always that chance. Ah, Well, most research shows that there's a robust species barrier. Robust, Dave, (laughs) meaning a huge, robust species barrier. Uh, This recent study showed that barrier may not quite be as robust as we once thought. Head of the Chronic Wasting Disease Alliance in Fort Collins, Colorado, Matt Dunphy, said trying to save his job with his life. It certainly is disturbing that it managed to cross the species barrier to monkeys. Should we be concerned? The article said looking for more clickbait. Uh, probably not. No. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Where are we off to next after you've so uh, easily tried to dismiss what is a very alarming story? <laughs> and don't think I'm not watching you, Nesmith and Dolans. I think Nesmith and, and Dolans will, will be all right. I think. Uh huh. Um. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, what? What, Tim? Is there another zombie uh, story for us, Tim? Is that what you're afraid of reading, Tim? You're really trying to nail it home on birthday week, aren't you? <laughs> this, this one's a different kind of story. Okay, though. this one uh, is asking, do zombie shows lead to mass shootings? Kentucky governor 
Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I know. Now, I, I say, I believe that the <laughs> zombie apocalypse TV, I say TV shows, lead to violence. I, I guess I don't have to pick on Kentucky, then you're going to do it. <laughs> Kentucky. Let, let's just hear this play out. Kentucky Governor Matt Bevan, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, thinks so. Thank you, Kentucky. Gun regulation isn't the solution to mass shootings in the U.S., Kentucky Governor Matt Bevan said Tuesday. And America's culture of death, illustrated by Americans' obsession with zombie television shows, is more to blame. This according to the governor. In a radio interview with conservative talk show host Leland Conway, the Kentucky Republican said new laws aren't the solution to violence, but addressing a culture of death in media is the start. It starts with everything from the type of entertainment that we focus on, Bevan said. Uh, what the, what's the most popular topic that seems to be in every cable television network? Te- television shows are all about what? Zombies. I don't get it. That's what we are. Well, I don't know about that. I, uh, the, the ratings mm-hmm. have gone down on zombie shows. Uh, Bevan went on to say Kentuckians are staunch defenders of the Constitution and that liberal attempts to enact gun control won't be successful. He added that violent shows are morphing the minds of young, impressionable children. When a culture is surrounded by, inundated by, rewards things that celebrate death, whether it is zombies and television shows and number of abortions, there's a thousand justifications for why we do this, Bevan said. Last month, Bevan literally shot grenade launchers and threw smoke bombs in a video as an analogy for blowing things up like corruption, blowing things up like pay-to-play and inside deals, he said in a tweet featured, featuring the video. Uh, in June of 2018, Bevan blamed video games, psychotropic drugs, and smartphones as some of the root causes for violence in America's schools. Uh, Bevan's comments come a week after a mass shooting at the Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks, California, which left 13 people dead. It was the 307th mass shooting in the United States this year alone, according to Gun Violence Archive. Uh, Bevan, who said he is running for re-election in 2019 but has not filed candidate papers or started fundraising, is polling poorly right now in the Bluegrass State. A poll by Morning Cons- Consult uh, released this past summer showed the Kentucky Republican ranked as one of the top 10 least, least popular governors In the U.S., but Bevan said Tuesday he doesn't care much for polling and doesn't think it offers any insight about his reelection. Because I say I'm the most popular governor within the confines of my own house. I say my own house. (laughs) And he sounds like Foghorn Leghorn, evidently. Uh, Bevan asked the radio host, Have you ever seen a poll in which I wasn't unpopular? That sounds like a Chevy well, I Chase was, skit. I, I, yeah, I, was, I think there was a poll down at the uh, the Sugar Shack where they they think you're very popular. That's right. The more you spend, yeah, the as more long as you bring dollar you bills, you're very popular. That's right. I have been unpopular and expected to lose. He went on to say, my unfavor on my unfavorable has always been higher than my favorables. Those things are a joke. It makes no difference. He was quoted as saying, "There you go. Way, way to go, Matt Bevan." Way to go, Matt Bevan. All right, Tim, where are we off to next in the world of supernatural news? Well, there may be some not just good news out there, Dave, great news out there for Ghostbusters fans. You know, that last movie, mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know what you thought of it. I know. Uh, You know, it's so, I'm... I, I didn't like it. I think we were pretty open about it. It, it had nothing to do with the fact that it was an all-woman cast. I appreciated different aspects of the characters they brought. Yeah. It was just a poorly done and executed movie. That's the real problem. I think we all can agree on that. But Dan Aykroyd has some great news. These just They've just uh, reignited talk of a third film reunion uh, going way back. Aykroyd's Ghost Corps uh, has long been developing a Ghostbusters 3. We've heard the rumors. Uh, which was constantly being held up by co-star Bill Murray. Uh, story details have leaked, thanks to Bloody Disgusting, and they learned that the film was to star uh, Dana, Sigourney Weaver, and Peter Venkman's Murray's love child, to clarify it's Dana's son, Oscar, a post-grad student who was forced to take over the business after Venkman dies in the first scene. Murray's character was to be a ghost in the third film, which allegedly had been greenlit up until Harold Ramis got sick and eventually passed away. Uh, Paul Feig then came in and uh, put a new spin on Ghostbusters, assembling an all-female crew and attempting to echo the original film's comedic cast. Um, 
from there, we kind of, you know, took that mediocre turn towards things. And then digressing, Ackroyd took a look at it. He wasn't a fan either, uh, publicly expressing disdain for the film and blaming its failure on Feig's balloon budget. Uh, while Feig uh, has expressed interest in returning to the director's chair for a sequel, Ackroyd will never let that happen and has not only been developing an animated feature, but also reviving the original long-developed Ghostbusters 3. Ghostbusters News has the story, who reports... Uh, that Ackroyd was a special guest on last night's episode of Access TV's The Big Interview with Dan Rather and revealed that they are currently working on the screenplay that, get this, allegedly could have the support of Murray. The quote is, there is a possibility of a reunion with the three remaining Ghostbusters, said Ackroyd. It's being written right now. He also added, I think Billy will come. The story is so good, even if he plays a ghost. The latter comment implies that they could be poking around the previously greenlit screenplay, which would have to be remitten to or rewritten rather to omit Ramus's scenes. I think a reunion in which a torch is passed to a new generation of Busters is the only direction this franchise could go, according to the story. Although an animated feature sounds pretty good as well. What do you think, Dave? Do you think animated or live action? Uh, you know. As much fun as I think some animation is, I really don't. I never got into the Ghostbusters cartoons at all. Mm -hmm. Nothing about it um, intrigued me, and and kind of I I'm a little bit over the Ghostbusters franchise altogether. You know, I think it has a great part in pop culture, and I I almost think that they should just leave Ghostbusters alone. Or if they do it, it should be you know kind of done in a um, a fun little way where the Ghostbusters definitely hand it off but it should be handed off in the first five to ten minutes and they should have a nice diverse cast you know if they even could bring together the female cast and um you know some of the cast members from the female cast and members of uh you know a, a, another ensemble and match them up together mm -hmm. um to to kind of give that a new kick i wouldn't be opposed to that although it kind of appears that the ghostbusters new cast is in a kind of its own universe its own bubble universe mm -hmm. You know, as this is the first introduction of the quote unquote Ghostbusters. So I don't know that they can coexist. But again, I'm getting way too nerdy for this uh, segment. But, I, you know, I, I would like to have seen something more like that. So if you had to pick two brand new comedians from this generation to place in Ghostbusters, because mind you, Chris Farley was rumored to be one of the guys that they were going to bring in back in the day when they were green lighting Ghostbusters 3 or when they were trying to write it. Uh -huh. uh, who'd you pick? See, I thought I loved Kristen Wiig in the last one. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even mind. I didn't mind any of the women in the cast, actually. They were all fine. And I wouldn't mind having any one of them be a part of this. Mm -hmm. um, the male contingent to me, and I know it's it's almost, you know, uh, ridiculous to say because they're the, the ones that would come to mind first of all. And, and first and foremost, I think Paul Rudd. Yeah. Steve Carell. Yeah. Jonah I, Hill. Yep. Uh, those would be some of my favorites. I wouldn't want some of the more over the top, like the Danny McBrides and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, and maybe even a Woody Harrelson, I think would have been fun to see, oh, yeah. um, yeah. in a role like that. But, uh, I, you know, that would be kind of my, my take on it. I don't know that there's any of the new younger wave of comedians necessarily. They're all too kitschy and smarmy for me, but, uh, the guys I think that would get it and play it out well would be like the, the Carell, Jonah Hill and, um, and uh, Paul Rudd. Yeah, I agree. It's Steve Carell is the first name that comes to mind when I when I think of uh, Steve Carell, and I think Kristen Wiig would be two that I would pick right off the right off the bat. All right, very cool. Where are we off to next? Uh, we go to Michigan, where a woman believes her antique potato masher is haunted, and she has video to prove it. <laughs> Oh, my. A woman who believes <laughs> potato her... potato masher? A potato masher, yep. Oh, okay. It, you know, of all the haunted objects I would pick... I think a potato masher would be right down near the bottom. A, a woman who believes her home is a hotbed of paranormal activity released astonishing video footage of a haunted antique potato masher. You heard it right, just in time for Thanksgiving and Dave's birthday. Uh, the masher was passed down to her by her grandmother, who's probably still in that masher, uh, since moving into her 1920s house in East Point, Michigan, five years ago, 43-year-old Jennifer Bauer often heard spooky noises. During this latest unexplained incident in October of 2018, she was photographing items she wanted to sell. 
Why would you get rid of the masher? Bauer was in her basement when she heard an odd whispering noise before seeing the old-fashioned potato masher begin moving of its own accord. Dun, dun, dun! The masher had been in storage for years. Capturing the whole bizarre happening on film, Jennifer recalled, I was planning to sell a few items at a flea market, so I was down in the basement photographing things. I was taking a picture of an old Monopoly set when I heard what sounded like a man whispering in the room next door. I went to investigate, but it was empty. I was home alone. Then the potato masher, which was an antique my grandmother handed down to my mother and then myself, began to move on its own. It was then I discovered it was potato mashing time. <laughs> I made that last part up. Yeah. I grabbed my camera and started filming, but didn't watch my video back until a few days later. Why did they always wait? When I did, I could hear an odd whispering in the background. I can't explain it all. No stranger to the supernatural, Jennifer, who lives with her boyfriend, Christopher, who's 42, cradle robber, first started hearing eerie noises like footsteps at a previous address. She said, or Bauer went on to say, If I went to check, there'd be nobody there and they'd stop. If it wasn't just me, my family heard them too and my friends. It wasn't an old house. It, I, I, it only been there for about 10 years but I thought it was probably haunted. I was never really scared, but my friends were, especially if they were staying the night. They were afraid of a potato masher, Dave. Just saying. Jennifer's basement, where the incident occurred, is uh, not very scary. I just uh, I just want to add that. I'm looking at a picture. There's a box labeled 72 English muffins, Dave, and it's scary. It's a white box with black lettering. And it, it could jump out at you. Uh, then after a, a full several years, of, after a lull, rather, several years without any ghostly happenings, uh, when she moved into her current home, the spooky activity started up again. She continued, when we first moved in, a lot of the rooms were totally empty. We'd be sitting watching TV and hear banging above us, <laughs> like someone walking around. As soon as we filled the rooms with furniture, the noises stopped, probably because the ghosts were tired and needed to sit down. <laughs> I made that last part up as well. Christopher was very skeptical you at first. You promised that that was your last bad joke at the beginning, Tim. I, and I know. You just uh, keep firing them over our bow. I do. Uh, Christopher was very skeptical at first, but our friends who have come over have heard things too. On top of the mysterious footsteps, Jennifer said she often hears whispers, usually in a man's voice, but occasionally in a woman's too. Again, her friends have witnessed the creepy conversation. She continued, Once I had friends over, when we thought we heard someone arguing outside but when we went out nobody was there oh there's such a cute picture of the two of them hugging here adding another time my friend could hear a racket in the back garden when he said sounded like a dinner party but it was 2 a.m of course nobody was there a dinner party in the yard dave a dinner party in the yard wouldn't that be like a yard party it would it'd be a garden party dave and i believe ricky nelson sang about it Another bad joke. We don't have neighbors either side, so we don't know that it could be that. Or so we know it can't be that. The whispering is definitely coming from inside the house, Dave. Inside the house! Oh my god, it's every horror movie come to life. As the whispers are not always in the same voice, though, Jennifer said she cannot work out if it is a spirit, and if so, why they are there. Oh my Mm. god, this potato masher looks like an oar, Dave. Like an oar! Would you, you know, just out of boredom, would you just grab a mundane tool like the potato masher and just start start mucking with it to get people's attention? I would. I'd put it on a string, float it through the house. To make matters more confusing, she has not yet been able to decipher what they say. The whispers, that is. Bauer said the house has been standing since the 1920s, but we don't know of anything in its history that would explain this. It sounds ridiculous, but we also sometimes see a gray mist about the place. Overall, I don't feel scared although i don't like the whispers several of my friends even christopher have said that they've heard them too after the last incident with the haunted potato masher which jennifer had unpacked planning to sell it when she finally watched the footage back she was astonished to hear odd noises which she said sounded more like whispering as well as running water Hmm. christopher asked if there was any way i was making that sound but if you watch the video i'm standing very still since filming it I've watched it over and over and noticed something new every time. Since the unexplained incident, uh, she has held on to the masher, concerned about selling it to someone else because of its spooky behavior. She concluded, I haven't seen it do anything since. It's not particularly valuable. 
the masher, that is. But now it's going absolutely crazy, and I simply can't explain it. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I just felt the need to throw Dragnet in there. Yeah. Because it's so uh, They've made quite a bit about a little bit of a rock. And, yeah, although the video is kind of weird, because this the masher is just kind of wobbling back and forth on its own. And just kind of go into town and there's nobody there touching it. It is it is weird. I will say that. Watching it, I didn't know what to expect, but I went in and I watched it. I, I, her reactions and the kind of... I might be a little over the top for my, my liking, but uh, yeah, it, it it's it's weird. How did it feel to lose that much of your life on a haunted potato mesh? Hmm. I'm just wondering. I don't know. Hmm. All right, where okay. are we up to next? A doorbell camera captures a ghost playing knock and run. Or what do we call it here in the States? <laughs> Ding dong ditch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, psychic but it's probably knock and run if you're not ringing the bell, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, psychic consulted after footage from homeowner's CCTV appears to show a figure approaching the front door handle and shaking the porch light. I think I've done that on many a doorstep, shaking my porch light, if you know what I mean. A vigilant homeowner fears she may have been the victim of a haunting after her motion-activated security camera caught footage of a ghost knocking at her door. Either that or the person was two foot three. 46-year-old Manny Petosha hmm, was waiting for a parcel to be delivered at her home when footage was recording, appearing to show a faint apparition emerge from a bench on the left of the screen. The figure then crosses in front of the camera, almost looking directly at it. It then passes out of view, moving to the right before the camera sensor stopped recording. Uh, Mrs. Petosha of Vaughan, Ontario, Canada, said... My dog started barking and ran towards the door. I was awaiting a package, so I figured it was the courier approaching. Looking outside the large window opposite her front door, she could not see anyone standing at the door or near her porch. Baffled, she dismissed her reservations, thinking her dog might have heard a noise outside. Then as I was turning around and going back into my kitchen, I received a notification on my phone, doorbell alarm activation. So I looked at the video and said, what the heck is this? The visit was made even more chilling by the significance of the bench seen on the left of the video, uh, which was given to her by a former neighbor, Mario. I love his uh, brother, Luigi. They used to live right next door. <laughs> uh, shortly before his death, uh, she recalled one psychic said to me, does that bench hold any significance? I said, why? And they said, well, the spirit looks like it was sitting on the bench. The bench was given to me by somebody that was very close to me and passed away. Uh, and the anniversary of his death is coming up this week. He was my neighbor. I'd known him my whole life and had grown up across the street from him. And when my father passed away, he would uh, always help us. The last conversation I had with him was sitting on that bench. Others have suggested that the presence is best explained by an insect, an animal, or a plastic bag. But Mrs. Petosha is unsure. Hmm. I don't know. Normally, I'm with you on that. And again, watching this video, mm -hmm. this doesn't look like a bug. It looks like uh, the predator, you know, that kind of shimmery oh, yeah. outline of a human coming up to the door. It, it's I, I would normally go bug as well. If this thing's a bug, it's flying in a very unique pattern that makes it look humanistic in nature and it approaches the door. It starts farther away and comes towards the door. I don't know, man. Look, check it out for yourself. It's it's a weird piece of video. Can I call it a ghost? No, but there is definitely some kind of visual disturbance, but only in a fragmented segment that looks like a person being blurred out. It's really bizarre. So Mario's become the predator. It's me, Mario. And he, and he shimmers out. It's kind of weird. It's the same. Some people thought it was a cat or a raccoon or a squirrel, she said, but it couldn't have been because it's four feet off the ground at the <laughs> it is Mario at the level where you would ring the doorbell. She added a lot of my friends say you should get your house smudged with sage to fend off evil spirits. She did not believe the ghost was of a vengeful or malevolent nature. So there you go. It is Mario. I don't, I don't think it's Mario either, but it is, it's a unique looking piece of video. I do find it intriguing of, of all the kind of CCTV doorbell video that I've seen. This one's weird. I mean, it, well, I don't know. You're, you're more of the skeptic than I am. Take a look at the video and, and tell me what you see. Tell me what you think it is. Like right now. Yeah. 
I just close. That's up. the beauty of of uh, editing. You can always cu- cut out the quiet bit while you're watching it. And we can come back and and d- talk about it. I just closed out the story. Actually, oh. yeah. yeah. Well, you should you should check them out sometime. It's a pretty interesting. Uh, it, it is a weird piece of, of video. I, I got to give them that. That it is a very strange piece of video. I'll believe you that Mario turned into the predator. I believe if if he can. Uh, if he can eat magic mushrooms and grow, he can become the predator. I believe. Where are we it. off to next? <laughs> we go to Peru, Dave, where a Peruvian woman claims a possessed doll attacked her boyfriend. And I say, why not? That's what I say. Okay. A woman in Peru says that her life has been torn asunder thanks to a possessed doll with a penchant for causing mischief. The unfortunate individual at the center of the strange case is reportedly named Berlize. And uh, she resides in the Peruvian city of Caleo. Caleo, right. Uh, The doll in question, dubbed Daisy, uh, was a Christmas gift from her mother, but the presumably well-intentioned present uh, may have been best left for someone on the proverbial naughty list if the beleaguered Berlese uh, story is to be believed. According to her, the doll suddenly began losing its hair, which led Berlese, for reasons unexplained, to wrap the head of the toy with a plastic bag one evening and point it so that it was no longer facing her while she slept the following morning she awoke to find that the balding doll had moved and was now watching her suggesting that the toy's hairless cranium may have been more than a mere factory defect and instead something sinister was afoot the suspicion yeah, that's a hell of a factory defect. Yeah, that's all is attacking people. Yeah. yeah, I think the batteries are in upside down. <laughs> There's no batteries. OK, Satan. Yeah. No. Uh, these suspicions were born out shortly thereafter. Belize says uh, when Daisy attacked her boyfriend, recounting the unsettling incident, which she attributed to jealous on the part of the doll. <laughs> that's that's uh, actual. Uh, 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 I, I lost words there. Spit it out. Spit it. Words is hard, Tim. Words is hard. That's an, that's an actual, uh, I can't say it. It's an actual attribute of the doll. It's, 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 it's a, a no, feature. Stick with attribute. Let's just go yeah. with that. Uh, the ill-fated Christmas gift fell onto the man and grabbed him and hit him. As one can imagine, being attacked by a possessed doll was a bridge, too, for her unnamed beau, uh, who has since ended the relationship, leaving Berlese and Daisy to sort out the issues on their own. Since that time, the doll has continued to torment Berlese by creating the illusion that there are strangers in her home and using its poltergeist powers to break things throughout the house. The paranormal activity has purportedly become so problematic for the woman that she's not only opted to keep the doll outside the home, but also, in an appropriately weird twist to an already strange story, purchased a black cat in an effort to offset the dark forces that have taken hold of Daisy. Is, is that how that works? You you buy a black cat and it makes the ghosts in your doll go away? I don't think that's anything close to the way it happens, but okay. <laughs> Not quite sure. Well, yeah. I mean, here, here I guess, having watched Sabrina, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, I do know that the witch is familiar, which in Sabrina's case is a black cat, can protect her against other supernatural forces. So maybe if, if this woman is a witch, she in fact can employ her black cat to dispatch the evil deity that's attached to uh, Daisy. Daisy's not really a, a very demonic sounding name, though, is it? No, it's spelled with no. an E I. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, that makes it even creepier. Yeah. yeah. All right, where are we off to next? Japan, where skeletons found in a ghost boat have washed up in Japan. The vessels are believed to be from North Korea. I, I guess that makes it spookier. Uh, scores of dilapidated wooden boats, believed to be from North Korea, have washed ashore in northern Japan. In a seasonal influx, the Coast Guard said Monday that 95 rickety boats, the name of my new band, uh, some carrying skeletonized bodies, have arrived so far this year, a pace that is likely to exceed last year's record 104 arrivals. You may ask yourself, what in the hell's wrong with North Korea? I've asked that now. It said 12 bodies have been found on the boats. Winds and currents push dozens of ghost boats onto Japan's northern coasts annually. Rickety North Korean fishing boats are particularly vulnerable because they lack the sturdiness and equipment to return home. Uh, Japanese authorities have stepped up patrols as the number of ship arrivals have soared in recent years. 
The increase may be related to a North Korean campaign to boost fish harvests to increase sources of protein for the nation, which is struggling to achieve food self-sufficiency and to overcome health problems caused by poor diets that, according to experts, to reach their quotas, North Korean fishermen may be taking more risks and venturing farther from their usual waters. More than one-third of the boats this year have arrived on Japan's northern main island of Hokkaido, uh, possibly because of attempts to travel further north to evade patrols by Japan's Coast Guard. The influx of ghost boats has also raised security concerns. Last year, the Coast Guard found about 30 bodies on the boats, while 40 others were alive. Researchers say they have spotted 13 hidden missile bases as well in North Korea. There you go. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good to know on that aspect. Uh, all right, where this is our last story. This is our last story. It's about a one point three million dollar dream home turned into a nightmare in twenty fourteen. A New Jersey couple bought their dream home in Westfield, and what's ended up being one of the more headline grabbing real estate purchases America has seen in recent years. That's all thanks to the Watcher, an anonymous sender of creepy and ominous letters to the new residents of six fifty seven Boulevard. Except residents is a misnomer. Derek and Maria brought us, and their three kids never actually moved into the home, having been so spooked by the contents of the letters, the first of which arrived as they were having renovations done. Uh, in a lengthy piece for the cut, Reeves Wiederman uh, shares extensive excerpts of the letters like this. The letter says, Will the young blood play in the basement, or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Wiederman traces in great detail the ultimately fruitless hunt to unmask the Watcher, recounting clues. One letter referenced an easel on a porch that could only be seen from the backyard or next door. The neighbors the family su- uh, suspected, the former FBI agent, security firm, and forensic linguist they hired to analyze the letters in their handwriting and the one small bit of DNA evidence they had. Uh, the story simultaneously tracks their quest to get out from under the burden of their purchase, which they were unable to sell. An attempt to raise the home and divide the lot into two smaller ones was prohibited by the town's planning board after an outcry from residents. Some suspected a scam. Lawsuits went nowhere, and the renter they finally found received, you guessed it, a letter from the watcher. Derek's belief, in my view, the sender lives in one of the ten houses in the world. Uh and, yeah, and in, in their world, meaning right around there. I, I had the same trouble when I looked at that story. Yeah, they they think it's one of those ten houses right around in that area where this person is stalking and bothering them. Yeah, that would make me even more uncomfortable. You know, it's one thing to have some kind of wackadoo out there, but then to know that it's probably one of your neighbors that's screwing with you and sending you these creepy ass messages. It's weird. Mm-hmm. And that's it. That's that's what I've got. No. All right. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, Paris share. And remember, if you'd like to call in and be a part of our show, call our voices from beyond voicemail. 651-300-4977. 651-300-4977 is the number to call. We will be back. We've got your stories next right here on Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. All right, welcome back to the show. This is Beyond the Darkness, the best in paranormal talk radio. Every weekend, tune in and check out the show. Tomorrow, Tim, we're going to uh, we're going to do something for the fifty fifth anniversary um, in in memorial of Kennedy's assassination. We're going to do our final Kennedy show. Mm-hmm. I, I just don't see doing any more Kennedy shows after this. I I can't believe that they would have to come out with something so amazing that would blow me away but our guest tomorrow claims that he has been in possession of evidence um of the kennedy assassination and some insights into the story that have not been out before so we're going to talk with him tomorrow but i i think this will be our final jfk conspiracy show going forward uh so check it out tomorrow if if you're fascinated by conspiracy fascinated by this and would like to hear from somebody who is actually in possession of evelyn lincoln's 
um, box of evidence, uh, Evelyn Lincoln, of course, being John F. Kennedy's uh, personal secretary. Uh, and, and it was well known that she had kept quite a bit of information and was kind of the keeper of the, the gate for a long time. So our guest tomorrow has got some really interesting insights. I will say because of the um, scope of the show, we're not going to do a theater of the mind because this doesn't really fall in the realm of the paranormal. It's definitely more in the, the realm of conspiracy. And I want to just give the devil it's due for this episode. So we'll be back again, sprinkling in more theater of the minds as we go forward. And remember, if you'd like one of your stories featured on an upcoming Theater of the Mind, just send me an email and give me a good narrative version of your story. You hear how they sound on Theater of the Mind. Write your real account that way as a narrative, and we may uh, we may read it and share it on an upcoming episode. Let's get to some of these emails. And again, you can always email your stories to me, Dave at DarknessRadio.com. Dear Dave and Tim, hey, that's you and me. Yeah. I wanted to tell you about the strange experience that I had on a Monday morning. And wonder if you two had any thoughts on it. I woke up at around 3.30 to use the bathroom. On returning to my bed, I closed my eyes. And although not asleep, I started to see images that appeared to be like a motion film. It looked like I was seeing it through night vision glasses. The vision was tainted green with a target in the middle. Army troops in lorries following tanks and flags that came into vision, my vision, from the right and then turned right so traveled away from me, but remained in my central vision heading towards a ridge. It was dark, but I could see the sand flying up as the vehicle sped into the distance. The soldiers were sat in the back of the lorries, holding guns in front of them, poised, ready. I then saw two soldiers who stood by a missile launcher with missiles by their feet. When I awoke at uh, 7 a.m., I told my husband of the strange experience, but he thought that perhaps I was dreaming, having fallen asleep quickly. I looked at the BBC World News website and saw images of the operation of services to liberate, is it Musal? Um, (laughs) M-O-U-S-A-L? I think think so. Mickey, you lived there at one time, yeah. The images posted by the reporter were exactly as I had seen. Very spooky. Was this astral projection, precognition? If so, what's the purpose? I had a similar experience a couple of years ago when I was lying in bed fully awake but had my eyes closed. I saw a boat sinking and actually watched the boat sink. The lifeboats were on the side and uh, were and they were seeking for survivors and someone filming the experience on their phone. It was dark and lights searched the water. I sensed the panic and fear and thought that uh, although most had survived, one person definitely died in that water. When I looked on BBC News and YouTube the following morning, it was posted that a boat full of asylum seekers had sunk off the Australian coastline. The Coast Guards and Navy had been observing the boats for some time and arrived quickly to save the occupants. Following both experiences, I sent my love, light, and healing to all of those concerned. But perhaps that is what I'm meant to do. I can't think of any other reasons to be shown these images. Well, I have so many ghostly tales to tell, past life memories of World War One and weird pictures and ghostly faces from the trench system on the Somme, but I will save those for another day. I love your show and enjoy every episode that I download. Uh, thank you very much for your time, energy, and effort that you two put into the show. My kindest regards to you both. Sue Williams from England. I don't know what the purpose is behind having those kind of dreams uh, or waking trance moments uh but obviously you're you're tapped into something and uh, you might not be able to help but you know start paying close attention to the details is there a name on one of the the outfits is there something that you can see that maybe you're supposed to pass a message along that that person's okay i i don't know it's it's hard to say but uh thank you for sharing hi dave and tim Before I get to the ghost stories, I just want to say thank you for your show. I love it. We don't really have any radio programs like this in Australia. Listening to you guys, guests, and callers make me feel like part of the uh, Darkness family, even though I'm so far away. Thanks again. And um, there are two camps, the smaller kids and university kids that celebrate Halloween in our country. Everyone else can't be bothered. Uh, or don't want to celebrate it for many different reasons, or it just slipped by and we didn't even notice. I'm just one of those last type. So they apparently are not big on Halloween over in Australia, Tim. Okay, ghost stories. Just a side note, ghosts and spirits must be a family thing. Being Catholic and spiritualist and Polish, it's a deadly mix. My great-grandfather was a medium in Poland and could call out spirits and could douse. Apparently, He was told to go easy on calling out spirits, but his dead father because or by his dead father, because 
they have work to do. Uh, takes a lot of energy and puts the balance of nature out of order. I don't know how or if he continued. My grandmother or uh, Babak, Babasha, Babusha, whatever I can't, B-A-B-C-I-A, Babasha, uh, never really elaborated on the story. My grandmother grew up in Lodz, not very far from the capital Warsaw during the World War II. She said ghosts were everywhere. She told me once she was playing or hanging out with her friends. It was getting dark and curfew was approaching. One of her friends said, Alexandra, my grandmother's name, I think someone wants to catch us and he has no feet. As they turned around, there was a man, tall, dark, and floating towards them. They screamed and started running in different directions. She didn't stop running until she got home. She also told me that when her grandfather died, she was at the wake, along with all the family members, including the brothers and sisters. It got quiet, and suddenly the cat had a, a kitten tick. Suddenly the cat had a kitten tick, where its fur stood straight up and it began hissing. The dog got up and moved as if it was being scolded. My great mother or my uh, grandmother stood up and started yelling at my dead grandfather. She stormed out of the room and suddenly an empty chair just aggressively turned over and the sound of heavy boots stomped away behind her. My grandfather told me about a process called a bleeding tree. I don't know if this is a traditional country or spiritual thing, but back to the story. Basically, you take a religious icon, you place it uh, in a young tree or plant so that the plant tree grows around it. The story that uh, if the plant or tree gets cut like a branch removed or chopped down, the affected area will bleed holy blood. So somewhere in the Polish countryside, there's a tree or many trees that might bleed or at least have iconic. Uh, how do you say this? Iconography? Icongra I, I, words are hard again today, Tim, they inside are. of them. Uh, icons inside them, we'll just say. My mom told me that when she was younger, she was in Poland and saw this actually happen. The tree had a thick, watery red sap bleeding from a broken branch. Maybe it was just a uh, red sap. I don't know. I'm not an arborist. Now that I can say. Ah. My mom told me about her favorite aunt, Christine. They used to hang out and talk a lot after she died in the winter sometime in the 70s. My mom was looking in a chest of drawers for a pair of gloves. Then something soft fell on her head. Sure enough, a pair of gloves on the floor. But uh, could... But they couldn't work out where they had come from. It could have fallen from anywhere beside the ceiling. My turn. I've always uh, felt different to everyone else, just different. I have visions, feelings, and hear things. I had a cat, a regular tabby, and he passed away quite horrifically. A few months later, my cousin gave me a new kitten. This little kitten was asleep on the couch. I was at a table doing something, and I heard a meow. This wasn't a kitten meow. This was a uh, you're late for dinner meow. I looked down thinking it might have been the kitten, but he was still asleep on the couch. I like to think it was an old cat coming to say hi and maybe score some food. To understand this next story, I have to give you a rough layout of my house. My kitchen and lounge room are connected by a glass sliding door that leads to a set of stairs going outside. I can see the bottom of the stairs from the kitchen window. I was doing something in the kitchen, trying to look out the window while standing on my toes. I'm very tiny, under five foot tall, when I finally could see out the window. I saw then a figure, completely red and very thin, one foot on the ground and one on the floor. But I wasn't scared, and I didn't think it wanted to hurt me. It just came by to say hi. Another time around this window, I was cooking and turned around. Out this window, I saw the back of a man. I saw a white shirt and a pleat and his short black hair. I blinked and he was gone. I asked him to come in and talk to me or I could go outside and talk to him, but no answer was given. Sorry about the long email, but I hope that you find my stories interesting. I apologize in any of the spelling or grammar or errors. I hate it too, but I always manage to have a few in there. I miss out on thanks again and happy Halloween. And that comes from Amanda. And it's funny as she's telling me the ghost story of uh, her cat, suddenly Mr. Mittens my uh, my familiar is in here purring at me and trying to climb up on uh, on the studio desk and and uh, interfere with our recording session. So I apologize Aww. if you suddenly start hearing banging and meowing, Tim. Well, All there's right, banging uh, over here, but no meowing. It's, yes. Yeah. Well, this one will be banging and meowing. <laughs> uh, I was working for a company based out of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in the Fayette, North Carolina office. The North Carolina office was being downsized, and my position was being moved to Hopkinsville. No problem. Neither state is my home state, and my wife is from Iraq, so no real ties, and it gives her a chance to experience other places. 
So we take a trip to let her see the town and get a feel for where we want to live. I get a room at the Hampton Inn and Suites, where I have stayed to uh, enough to have platinum status. Name dropper. Nice, clean little hotel with a great Mexican restaurant. You can walk uh, to and have a margarita. We arrived at uh, room 103 and unpacked to drive around and eat, come back, shower, and watch TV. We turn off the lights and everything is cool. She's sleeping and the bathroom light comes back on. It has a motion sensor on it, so I get up, uh, cycle the light, and go back to bed. About 2 a.m., the light comes back on. And I get up and cycle the light and shut the door. No problems. I'll just tell the maintenance in the morning. At 3 a.m., I have what I think is a nightmare of a boiling, roiling black mass that covers the floor to the ceiling, coming out of the bathroom, reaching for me. About five feet from the bed, I wake up screaming, crawling backwards towards the headboard. My wife doesn't wake up, which is weird. I have a surefire flashlight on the nightstand, so I fire it up and nothing is there. I can see the bathroom light is on again. I go back to sleep, writing it off due to stress. I tell maintenance about the light issue. I come back from my office. My wife says they came by and replaced the switch. Problem solved, right? No, not really. We were there three days. I had the same experience each night, and my wife woke up one of the nights moaning in her sleep. I didn't say anything about what I was seeing, and she just said she wasn't sleeping well. She hates hotels and is from Iraq and is not really used to a hotel stay. So once again, I kept my mouth shut, not wanting to look like an idiot. We got back to North Carolina just fine, and we're watching a ghost show on television, Ghost Adventures. And I said, babe, when we were staying in Hopkinsville, did anything weird happen while you were sleeping? She said, yeah. I asked what happened. She said, I saw a black cloud that was taller than you that looked like it had snakes in it and arms that reached towards the bed. I explained that I had seen a very similar thing. And she was like, I was scared to say anything because I was afraid you'd laugh at me. This was real to both of us. I came back to stay a couple of months later by myself and requested the same room just to see if it would happen again. When I requested requested the room, I was told it was being remodeled because of water damage. Okay, plausible. Two months after this, I was meeting one of the managers from North Carolina at the hotel to help her get checked in and go out to eat. Knowing the front desk folks, I asked about the room again. I asked, could she have room 103? She smiled at me and said, we turned that into a storage because of uh, a parking lot noise. I asked, are you sure people haven't complained about something else? She just smiled at us. So draw your own conclusions. That comes from Marion Wine. That's interesting. How about the fact that, uh, no, we've uh, shut down that room because, you know, there's a lot of complaints of parking lot noise. Or is it roiling dark black shadows? And why would you try to set your friend up into a room that had a terrifying entity in it? Worst best friend and coworker ever. (laughs) Hey, all right, Tim, we're back to a couple more emails here. Hi, Dave and Tim. Hi. Hi. I've written to you before about my experiences with my brother since he passed away almost six years ago now. We are constantly having little things happen that we believe are him, but every once in a while, something will happen that we definitely cannot ignore or explain away as being just anything but John making himself known to us. We lost our home in August to the flooding in South Louisiana. Our town was the hardest hit. I've heard as much as 90% is destroyed. The main street is basically a ghost town with very few businesses open, although the traffic is still very much present. Many people like us now live in travel trailers. In their driveways. Some are even in tents. Most had no flood insurance because their home was never supposed to flood. Anyway, I have felt my brother's presence very strongly throughout all of this. The hardest was standing in his room and trying to figure out what of the few things we still had we could salvage. But I felt him with me even then. We had many wonderful volunteers who came to help remove damaged items and pack up what we could possibly save. We will forever be grateful for all that they did. But with so many people comes the possibility for error, and some very special things were accidentally tossed out in the debris pile. Once in there, it's basically impossible to pull it out, not knowing where it is under all the waterlogged mess. One of these items was a small wooden box that held a lot of special memories from a trip my aunt took me on to Paris years ago. I went through a lot of uh, already packed boxes trying to find it, only to realize it was never likely to be found. It was devastating to finally accept that I would never find it in all of the pile. So I gave up and did the only thing I could do. I asked for my brother's help. I don't know how or why, but he's been very helpful in finding missing items several times in the past. We know it's him because the item will just suddenly show up somewhere where it wasn't before. 
like the middle of the floor or a completely empty cabinet drawer. And he definitely came through for me this time. The next day when I went to check the mailbox right in front of our driveway in a spot that somehow was clear of debris from the mountain of bags and waterlogged furniture, the little wooden box was sitting all alone at the edge of the road. There was absolutely no way it could have been there even just the night before. I will admit I broke down into tears seeing it there. I'd managed to hold it in most of the time since wading out through the flood waters, but this just got to me. With all of the uncertainty and heartache, it's nice to know our angels are still looking over us, even just to help you find a tiny, slightly broken wooden box. Thank you for letting me share my story with you, and that comes from Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. That's a sweet story. Very sweet. All right, uh, last few stories, Tim. A few years ago, guys, I was traveling in my car when a severe thunderstorm set down over the area. The rain started pounding down and I slow, as I slowed as visibility was reduced. A car was approaching me in the other lane and I saw a car coming up behind it very fast. And I knew right away that the second car was in trouble. I saw as he hit the brakes and slid over into my lane. At that same time, I'm heading for the shoulder of the road. The car slid back in his lane and then back in mine. And okay, this sounds nuts, but it did happen. The car came right through mine. I could feel this weird sensation as I saw this young kid about 18 or 19 as he passed through. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw the taillights behind me. I then hit the shoulder of the road. You have to remember that this all happened in just a few seconds. Stopped my car and totally broke down sobbing and shaking. Not because I was scared, but because... What had happened could not have just happened. I never told anyone. How could I? But a few years later, I was driving home from work. I'm a shift worker at an auto plant, and I was flipping through the radio stations when I found a station called Coast to Coast, and a guy was telling a story about the same event happening to him, except there were four of them in his car. It was awesome to hear his story and know that if I was crazy, at least there were others like me. I was hooked on Coast to Coast after that, which led me to your program. Love you guys, as you have great shows and a great sense of humor. Thank you for listening. And that comes from Annette. That's a crazy story. Yeah. Could you imagine that? Your life is flashing before your eyes. You see this car coming at you and through you. Mm. That's unreal. Mm. Hello, Dave. Hi, Tim. I've listened to your show for quite some time, and I honestly love it. I've had a lot of paranormal stuff happen to me, but I'll just stick with this one for now. I live close to a cemetery, so during the summer, my friends and I went for a walk towards there. The closer I got, the more I felt like I was losing control of my body. I was able to hear whispers of the spirits there. They were pushing me towards the inside of the cemetery. My legs kept moving when I tried to stop them. Right before I hit the inside of the fences, I saw my body go inside like I was standing beside my friends again. I fought to get back in my body. When I did, I was extremely disoriented. I kept hearing, you won't be able to see your friends again. You're mine. I had to close my mind off to get out of there. When I did that, I ran back to my friends telling them we needed to go. After we got back in town, I couldn't remember much of anything after the time I was in that cemetery. I just know I felt like I wasn't myself. And I was empty. So that was one of my paranormal experiences. Oh, I should probably say that I'm also a psychic. And that comes from Alora. Yeah, it sounds like you're psychic. Definitely mediumistic. You've got something going on there. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, Thank you very much for sharing that story. And our final story today, Tim. Hi, Dave and Tim. I just wanted to share an experience that happened to me a few weeks ago. On the evening of October 23rd, my husband and I attended Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party at Disneyland. If you've never been to this event and you love Halloween and Disneyland like I do, it's the best of both worlds. Everywhere we looked, adults and children were dressed in their Disney, Pixar, and Star Wars costumes. Even my husband and I were dressed as ghost hosts from the Haunted Mansion. As darkness began creeping into the park, the Halloween party was in full swing. We made our way to the trick-or-treat station scattered throughout the park. We ended up in New Orleans Square, so we decided we had better get in line for my favorite attraction, the Haunted Museum. Or Haunted Mansion, sorry. I was the one at the Haunted Museum on Halloween. (laughs) We boarded a Haunted Mansion Doom buggy, making our way throughout the mansion mingled with Haunted Mansion and Nightmare Before Christmas characters. The time came for us to leave our Doom buggy and... Our ride up the escalator had one last scene. It was a miniature Sally telling us to hurry back. I laughed and said I definitely would, but when I exited into the park, I suddenly felt an insane feeling of sadness and despair. I kept telling myself how stupid I was. 
uh, being. But as I looked around the park at all the happy people, all I could think about was I would never be here again. Deciding not to say anything to my husband, we made our way to the River Bell Terrace for an e- early dinner. Once our dinner order was taken, I decided to check my text messages and discovered my youngest sister had texted me. Our father, who is 96 years old and lives in a care in North, uh, Northern California, had become extremely upset and agitated. His caregiver was giving a, uh, having a hard time calming him down. Unfortunately, it was so noisy at the park, I couldn't hear the caregiver, caregiver when I called him. I texted my sister to have her call our other sister, because she has a way of calming down our father. After a wonderful dinner, we started to leave Disneyland to visit California Adventure when my feelings became overwhelming, physical, uh, overwhelmingly physical. Each step was filled with panic. My husband asked what was wrong, and I said I was just upset because my father, because of my father. I got as far as Main Street USA train trestle when I couldn't move any further. I had to fight back tears looking at those exit turnstiles ahead. My husband had gone ahead of me when he noticed I wasn't with him. He walked back and asked me what was wrong. This time I told him the truth. I just couldn't leave because if I did, I would never see Disneyland again. I was in tears. He assured me we would be back. And even though I knew he was right, I just couldn't force myself to leave. He asked me what I wanted to do. Then I heard the sound of the train's horn above us. And I knew I needed to ride that train around the park one last time. After boarding the train, I began to notice I was becoming less and less agitated as we journeyed around Disneyland. Once we arrived at Main Street USA Station again, I was back to normal. This time, I exited Disneyland without any problem. We had entered California Adventure to see their Halloween decorations when my sister called me. She told me everything was fine, not to worry, and to enjoy the rest of my vacation. After getting home a few days later, I spoke with her about that day. I told her what I had experienced. This is what she told me. Our father mistakenly thought... He was being evicted from his care home because I forgot to pay his monthly care fee. He became so distraught that he thought he was going to be forced out and leave his home and friends. They had to sedate him. My sister laughed and said, you did that weird thing again. That's why you couldn't leave Disneyland. You picked up on his feelings. I love your show. And that comes from Elaine. That is interesting. So she was picking up the empathetic link to her father who was feeling despair that he was about to be kicked out. I also submit one other possible context for that story, Tim. Okay. People at Disneyland and Disney world often talk about the fact that on video cameras, they've seen people take ashes and remains of loved ones into certain rides and dump ashes. And they've had to close down rides and, and clean and, and kind of remove these things. They've found urns in the Pirates of the Caribbean and Small World rides. Mm-hmm. They've, uh, they've all had these weird experiences at Disneyland seeing these type of things. So maybe it was the fact that one of the spirits in the Haunted Mansion, which is one of the more popular rides for people to uh, release some uh, uh, of, of the remains, mm-hmm. maybe it was just the spirit of one of those people that had, had kind of connected with you and as you were leaving the park it felt like if it left the park with you it would never get back in that might so it could have been both of those or one of those i'm not sure could be could be well that's it for today tune in tomorrow as we examine for the last time on the 55th anniversary of the assassination of jfk we'll be uh, talking tomorrow about a fascinating case with a gentleman who has insights and experiences unlike anyone else we've ever had a chance to speak with. That's tomorrow on The Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. For Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. You're listening to Beyond the Darkness.